What is going on, everyone? Uh, it is Thursday, July 29th, 2021. I am your host, Mark Real, and tonight on State of the Family Courts, we welcome Alabama attorney Michael Lambert. Michael, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so thanks for hopping on. So um, we didn't really talk about anything law pre-show. We were talking SEC football, but we'll go ahead and we'll hop into uh, Alabama law. So we start off every show talking about what the laws are and what's going on in the states. So we'll start out. We'll look at the NPO report card here. Alabama, um, another middle of the road. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the MPO report card, Michael, but they grade out every single state in the country on the basis of their, their custody laws in relation to equal and shared parenting. So Alabama grades out as a C minus, which is slightly below average. About half the country is in that C, C minus, C, C plus range. So firmly in the middle. So um, what do we got going on? on the ground in Alabama right now? And what does that look like? Well, in Alabama, um, when you're talking about particularly joint custody where both parents will be seen as equals, uh, fiscal custody as well as legal custody. Legal custody has been easy to do. That means access to records, access to extracurricular activities, what's going on with the child. But where you're talking about real equal rights and true starting on, a, on equal footing is joint physical custody. And that is a consideration that the courts have to take into account, especially um, when both parents are requesting joint custody. As a matter of fact, if the, both parents request joint custody, if the judge decides to go some, more, some other direction in his order, he has to say specifically what that is. Uh, there is pending legislation. Uh, it's listed on database with Westlaw. And the pending legislation will be similar to what's been passed in Arkansas, that the default position of the court in the beginning would be a rebuttable presumption that both parents would be equally entitled to physical custody or joint physical custody, and it would only be overcome by clear and convincing evidence. Now that law is not passed yet, so it's pending. That's just what's in the works, supposedly. And I say supposedly because being a lawyer, we always like things to pass before we say that they're law because they're not if they don't pass. And it's we're my understanding. Law. Yes, my understanding. And the biggest thing right now is it really depends on what judge you draw and in what jurisdiction. And that's not a disparaging comment or trying to be, I guess, lawyerly about it, but they're individuals and they apply the law as best as they can on the, on the circumstances. And I think domestic law, unlike any other type of law, is probably the hardest for judges to do. And the reason I say that is because they might have a one day trial. They might have a four day trial somewhere in between, but they only have a snapshot of these people's lives to determine something that's going to affect them for decades to come. So they, they have a heavy burden on them already. And it's very hard. The biggest thing that I see is some judges, uh, let's say the laws were different when they were practicing maybe. And when they're, they're doing their best to update and realize that, okay, wait a minute, you know, more moms and dads are both in the workforce now there's mental health issues are, are better known these days than they were in the past. Hey, domestic violence actually does happen both ways. Those are all things that judges are having to educate themselves on. And I'd like to say, I don't think the C minus reflects the judges that I practice in front of. Um, and I tra have traveled and tried cases in, I think seven, somewhere between seven and 10 counties, domestic cases in Alabama. And if, found the vast majority of the judges that they really, they really do try hard and do their best to get it right. Yeah. And then the NPO scorecard, just to clarify things for our viewers, that's not necessarily how good the judges are or how they make decisions. That is specifically, they grade out the laws as they come to equal and shared parenting. So for example, the NPO report card cites this, Alabama ex positives, Alabama explicitly permits joint custody and final orders. There are several states that unless the parents agree to it, they can't order joint custody. Um, wow, I did not know that. Yeah, so they, there are several states that, that the parents have to agree or the judge has to pick one or the other. Another one is Alabama requires the courts to consider the friendly parent factor. Um, this one's pretty common. I don't know how well it gets applied nationwide. I think it's it's pretty universal in, in just about every state. I know we have it here in California and we've had it in several of the states uh, that we've had attorneys on in the past. 
Um, but the friendly parent factor is a positive thing. If we go to the negative side of things, Alabama has no explicit provision for joint custody or shared parenting in temporary orders. Um, and I think as, as family law attorneys, that temporary order is so, so, so important. Oh, I, I agree, especially where you have, uh, you may have a parent who is, let's say, acting out and they can't keep their emotions in check in front of their children um, or that they make the mistake and confide in their children. I mean, we now know through science that a child's brain is not fully formed actually until they're 25. Being married to a former geneticist, you know, educated me far beyond what law school did. And when we realize that nowadays and now we can identify, you may have children that are on the spectrum and things that just weren't identified 20 years ago uh, that the courts are now dealing with. If we don't have that in a temporary order, if you don't have some some measure to where the judge can can really see on display, so to speak, how the parents interact with the child, it makes I think it makes the job harder. Yeah. And I mean, I think it goes to every single state. And I was actually on on another program over the weekend where they ran a study in, in Nevada. And you mentioned the caseload of judges. And this yes. study that they did in Nevada actually showed that essentially judges, uh, their judges were better or graded out as more fair with less of a caseload. So oh, we live, I live in some of the most populous counties. I, I work in some of the most populous counties in the country. And as you walk in there, there may be 20 or 25 other cases on that morning call. And yeah. it's like that even in some rural areas. I'm sure you practice in some uh, rural counties in Alabama where it's one or two judges. Uh, yes. In, my, in fact, my home county where I live has two judges. Uh, the neighboring county, I believe, has 10 circuit judges. Um, another neighboring county um, has three circuit judges. And I go all over North Alabama. So what's interesting is even our two judges that are here, um, because they are handling everything, um, it makes their jobs harder. I mean, they, what I would equate it to is a teacher in a classroom. If you have 12 to 15 students in a classroom, this, those kids are going to learn. If you have, you know, smaller dockets for the judges to handle, they can absorb, read everything that's filed. They'll have an easier time getting to things quickly especially when there's emergency issues or you have where you have domestic abuse or mental health concerns. I just, I, I really believe that Nevada study based on everything I've seen. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I mean, you, you look at it and that's one of the things that uh, you, I have to tell clients sometimes, especially when out here we get the ex parte hearings that get granted. Well, will the judge read everything that was filed? Hopefully. Um, it physically isn't possible a lot of times if they're going to have 25 other cases on their call the next morning and yeah, they had a trial the day before. Uh, and I'll say this, I've actually seen our judges here. I, I got to brag on them a bit and there's, and this isn't everyone obviously, but my experience has been very good as far as some of the judges here. I have no judges that have gone in and have worked entire Saturdays cause I'm getting orders on Saturdays because we're electronically filed here. Uh -huh. And I'm getting orders that, you know, 11 o'clock Saturday morning, five o'clock Sunday night, two o'clock Sunday afternoon. I mean, so I know they're diligently working like we are on the weekends and we're trying to catch up. And that's that's very encouraging for those of us in the trenches. Yeah, that that definitely when you know you have a judge that's truly trying to understand the situation and honestly get to the bottom of what's going on and make a decision that's best for the kid. Um, or kids, that that's definitely a good feeling. It's a secure feeling as an attorney, yeah. especially if you know your client's doing the right things. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So let, let's turn to more of kind of, we'll talk process, I guess, civil procedure or what happens in the state of Alabama. So I'll, I'll be your client. I'm sitting in your office. Um, and I say, my, my girlfriend won't let me see our child. Well, what happened, what, what's, what's the process look like? I have the, to what I call the talk with them first. I, I, okay. I tell people up front, everything show me is going to be attorney client privilege. You know, there's some urban myths out there that, Oh, do I have to pay you a dollar before you do that? No, you're consulting with me as an attorney. I've made sure there's no conflicts with your case before I consult with you. And we have the talk and I ask hard questions and I tell them up front. The number one thing is if you lie to me about anything, you're giving me grounds to not help you withdraw from your case or anything. I can deal or help you deal with whatever. I can't guarantee you that things are going to go well, 
but I can at least give you a truthful synopsis of where I believe your case may go. And then I ask hard questions, um, you know, domestic violence, control, things like that. Who's, who's there with the child? What's the work schedules? Have you lived in the same house? Did you welcome the child into your household? Have y'all held out to the community that you are the child, even if you're not, if you're the child's father, even if you're not married. Okay. Who are those witnesses who, who's going to get on the stand and tell the truth that yes, you know, you've, you've been uh, little Johnny's dad the whole time and brought him out and showed him to everybody. I, I went to the first birthday party, all those type of factors. Right. Mm -hmm. And th then the next question that may be odd, but there's something that I think is important. I asked them if there's any chance to reconcile and they're like, well, what do you mean? I said, and I, uh, I asked them if I can give them a personal story about it. And I said, look, my wife and I married 22 years. You know, we were, we were thinking of divorce at the 10 year mark. You know, we'd each made some mistakes and had hurt each other. And we chose to go work on our marriage and it takes both people being a hundred percent invested, but there are some tools out there and people I can direct you to that, that may be able to help you. And I'm, I'm happy to say we've actually had some success with that. It's not the majority, but you know, we hope we can build on it. And if it's not the case, well, it's okay. Well, how can we co-parent? Well, what are the things that you see positive in your baby's mother that, um, that you think she does well? What do you think there's some things that you do well? And then you try and start getting in that mindset of co-parenting. Well, if you've got a co-parent, well, what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Okay. Um, she might be angry right now, but on other things, is she generally a reasonable person? And regardless of gender, I mean, we're talking about fathers here, but that's the talk that I go through with folks. And it's about calming them down um, because they're already stressed. They're already upset. I mean, this is likely one of the most emotional times in their life. So they need to know that, okay, I, this is just a conversation. I'm, I'm, I'm walking through this because they've lived their life. I have to learn it, you know? So I'd be asking you these things, all these questions. And it's amazing how truthful people will be with you when you give them that chance to feel like they're a human being. And you, then I just answer them honestly. What do you think my chances are? You know, well, OK, primary caregiving. Who's been doing that? What will it look like in the future? What was your plan prior to y'all splitting up? And you go from there. Um, and I'll give you an encouraging thing we had happen recently. This is very recent, actually. Um, a couple's going for a modification. There, let's just say there's challenges on both sides. Um, we actually have a joint physical custody agreement with a school age child where they live more than 60 miles apart. Um, it was uh, kind of amazing how we pulled it off um, between splitting time on weekends, uh, making up times for in the summer and things like that but it really was almost a 50 50 split on time without putting a strain on the child. It took some work that the, the opposing counsel that I had was, was amazing on it, working with me to, to get it worked out. And these were people who were very combative when they came in, very combative for, for both had some legitimate reasons on both sides, but it was wonderful to see the father and the mother to work together to get that done. And even the judge was impressed that we got that done. But it took all it took everybody working together. It was not done. It was done over a matter of months, if you can imagine. Yeah, definitely. And I think uh, a couple points there. Number one is that uh, attorney client privilege uh, statement yes. I, in, in California. I forget the exact phrasing, but as long as you're legitimately inquiring about hiring an attorney and you're not just doing it to conflict them out. Yes. Then everything that's said in there does not leave that room. Um, and the worst thing you can possibly do is lie to your attorney or try to cover up facts. Uh, I have to explain in my contract when people sign a contract with me, I actually have that in bold. My contract is like a page and a third double spaced, you know, like times new Roman 12. And, uh, the funny part is it's actually in there in bold that if you deceive me in any way on a matter, it gives me the grounds to withdraw. And you recognize this. And people are like, oh, wow, you, you were serious about that. And I just smile and they said, oh, that's happened before. And I just smile and I'm like there's reasons for everything in my contract. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and here's the thing, too, is uh, as attorneys, we hear and see all sorts of different situations. Yes. We can usually manage bad facts, whether it be 
we we use the the eight mile method and we put it out there first to take the sting off of it or yes. we put it into context um but we can't do anything about bad facts if opposing counsel brings them up at a hearing and true, true. We, we look over at you and are like what did they just say yeah the biggest thing on that and and that is a brilliant brilliant point you bring up being honest with your attorney is the first step for the truth coming out in front of a judge. Um, judges are pretty savvy. Um, they, this isn't their first rodeo. The more truthful you are with the judge and being realistic about plans for the children, what you have lined up, the support system you have, what resources you bring to bear for the child, even the fact that, okay, I realize I've even had, I've even had people say this on the stand and they, and they meant it as far as I've ever known that yes, I know my ex-spouse or my ex-girlfriend did wrong when they did X, Y, or Z. And, you know, I've forgiven them for it. You know, it's not going to allow us to be together, but we need to co-parent. We need to co-parent for our child. That's still the mother of my children. Mm -hmm. And when you see that from a person who in their actions and in their words have meant it, that goes an incredibly long way. Um, so just learning the fact that, okay, the other person, might not be your your mate, but that child that you created, you got to view that child as having the best of both of you. Yeah. And a, another piece on that is, I mean, there we both have clients who it's if they say something, we know they mean it and we know they're 100 percent truthful. Yes. We also have clients that can be dodgy around uncomfortable facts. Yes. And if I go into court with that client that I know, if they tell me in the hallway, this never happened, they they don't have any proof of this, they're making this up. I feel more comfortable saying that with conviction to the judge that yes. this is the truth. Where if I know someone's being dodgy or they want to be indirect with their, their comments, indirect with what they're telling me, I'm not going to have that conviction in drafting briefs. I'm not going to have yeah. that conviction if I'm in chambers talking with the judge. I'm not going to have that conviction if I'm on the record in open court. So building trust with your attorney can make a huge difference in the outcome of your case just because of the level of comfort that we can operate with. And you also you also find that when when and I'm sure this has been your experience, too, that when you are forthright with a judge over a client making a mistake, but how they seek to mitigate it or remedy the situation or whatever it is, that judge normally what I've seen is a judge will that they, they give mercy that that's going to happen. If you're dodgy and you don't answer or you, you, you know, for lack of a better term, mealy mouth about it, as opposed to just stepping up to the plate, I think you lose respect to the court. And I think the judge looks at whatever comes out of your mouth after that as with, with some real discernment that might not go in your favor. Yeah. I, I tell a lot of clients when there'll be a bad fact, they made a mistake. I was like, okay, well, we're going to, we're going to lead with that. We're going to say, Hey, I made a mistake. Exactly. This happened. And they'll be like, well, what if they aren't going to say it? What if they aren't going to bring it up? That's going to build instant credibility. And let's be honest, when we're talking about the standard being the best interest of the child, and it's going to, if it devolves into it, it's going to turn into trashy and the other parent, it's going to come up. But we've been able to take the sting and frame it how we want to frame it. Whether it's you've recovered from that, fixed that problem, it's extremely old, we'll be able to frame it exactly how we want to frame it to take the sting out of it. Exactly. And if a person has, uh, whether it's whether it's uh, substance abuse, um, whether it's uh, domestic violence in there, there is help that people can seek out. And by seeking out that help before they're made to seek it out and then actually showing change goes a long way with the court system because you've just relieved the court from having to go through a lengthy process to do those things, whether you be a mother or a father, either one. Um, and one of the biggest things that I've seen is um, this is unpopular advice to give to anybody, but I give this to friends as well as to clients. You hear the phrase oftentimes, well, I'm talking to somebody. That's the new phrase, right? Of the day. Uh -huh. And what I tell, tell everyone is this, I said, divorce or breakup is like death without the closure. And I said, the problem is, I said, you're not emotionally ready to be with anybody. And I think you'll find that right now, blood's in the water. 
and sharks are circling. And here's what I mean by that. Basically, you're going to have a lot of people coming, and there's and the devil doesn't come with a pitchfork and, and horns. He comes with a with a nice smile and a, and a, and a nice looking guy or a nice looking girl, right? And you're not ready for that. You're vulnerable. You got to grieve. You got to get past it. And it takes about six months to a year from the date it is over before you can do that. I said, anything else is going to mess you up. And I've had more than one client stop by the office after everything's over. You know, they knock on the door and they're like, hey, do you have a minute? What not? I said, hey, meter's not turned on. Come on in. You know, I'll, unfortunately, 95 percent of all the clients I've ever had, I love them. They're, they come by. They're welcome. I, I love sitting down and having coffee, just chatting with them with a human being. And they'll look at me and they'll say, you remember that advice about sharks in the water? I just smile. Yeah. And they say, most of them say, you know, I may not have listened to that, but before I got too deep in, I heard your voice go off in my head. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's good. You know? So that's another thing that I would tell people, focus on the problem at hand, get the, get your house in order to where, when you do move on, basically history never repeats itself. You, you're making a better choice. You've got some wisdom from the, from the experience you've been through. And I know that sounds more of the counselor at law than the attorney at law, but it, uh, I think they go hand in hand in domestic. Yeah, the, it, it amazes me. And I mean, there's still, I'm sure still, you're, you're a lot longer into this than I am. But every single day you hear another story, you hear something that you didn't even know was possible. Yes. Um, and, and you just kind of have to shake your head and uh, it comes to a point where you're numb and you can take just about anything in stride. But on the getting into relationships issue, my, my client base is exclusively male. Gotcha. And probably 80 to 90 percent of them are fathers. Gotcha. And uh, so I'm always amazed at the number of men and not necessarily just clients, but everyone who comes through my office or in in COVID world, Zoom or a phone call that one of their questions when they're ready to file for divorce is, well, can I still have that joint bank account with my girlfriend? Like about I live with my girlfriend now and you just kind of in your head, you're like, wait, you just came to me to file for divorce. Mm -hmm. Like how deep are you into another relationship already? Yes. And is it, is yes. it a coping mechanism? Is it, was it just like the next closest warm body to help you get through this process? Well, to me, the biggest thing that you see with that, and I'm also a registered mediator here in the state and uh, I mediate both civil and domestic and I got registered for domestic violence as well. It's amazing to me what I've seen over my career when people do exactly what you're talking about, because here's the thing. It always comes out. Lawyers do their job. They're going to find the They're going to find the paper trail. And when they find the paper trail, you, you and I both know when there's a longer paper trail to follow or track down, all that means is we lawyers make more money. And that may sound like a really good thing, but I'm sure you agree with me. I would much rather know up front and I would much rather just deal with it and call it a day because it's going to be a lot cheaper on the client. It's going to be a lot easier for the judge. It's going to be a lot easier, for, most importantly, for the children because you can you can deal with that and go on. It's when they come to you, like you said, at that last minute. Oh, by the way. Yeah, that's, that's never a good situation. Well, the, the other thing when you come out, you talk about having that uh, that conversation about truthfulness in the beginning. Yes. Uh, everybody. And I mean, whether it be in Southern California, whether it be in small town Alabama, whether it be in New York City or the middle yep. of the country, cost is always a factor with an attorney. Yes. Um, and if you leave out early in the case major facts, I can guarantee you it's going to cost you exponentially more on the back end because yes. we're going to have to backtrack and redo a lot of work, re-strategize, yes. rethink our plan of action. So being just 100% blunt, open and honest, like the question I always ask once I've gotten them talking are, what is the, what are the worst three things that your ex is going to say about you? And I yes. want to hear in, in, in gory detail, like what are they going to say about you? Oh, well, yes. they're going to say on the day I hit them and go into details and, oh, well, I, I drink every single night or I smoke a lot of weed. Um, if we know that on the front end, we can fix those issues. Exactly. If, we build a case, if we build a case strategy and start executing on it, and yes. then at court hearing number three, opposing counsel brings up the argument, 
all of a sudden we got to go back to block one and rebuild your case. Oh yes. And, and the other thing, uh, especially with men, uh, this is, this is a big issue. Um, I, um, so many men do not want to report domestic violence when they're the victim and men, in my opinion, who are raised correctly, um, don't want to be violent towards their, their spouse if their spouse is female. Um, but what we're seeing on the rise is in same sex marriages, domestic violence is more prevalent and less reported. And we cannot be afraid to have those conversations and make sure that people are being safe. Uh, we just had someone tried in the next county over. One of the most horrible situations I've ever heard of. Uh, there was a protection from abuse in place. Uh, the gentleman had been, I think, charged with domestic violence, uh, killed the family, killed the wife, killed the children, on and on. J six years to get him convicted. And the, qu the thing is, if there's domestic violence, I think the one thing that we as attorneys have to tell the men who may be the victim, we have to tell them, look, you can't stay where you are. Where can you go that's safe? But our society, we think, well, you're a man, you're supposed to be able to protect yourself or whatever else. I don't care if you're a six foot eight, 325 pound lineman, you know, in those states like Alabama, where we believe in the right to, to carry your firearm, a woman can shoot you dead just as easily as a man can. And it's a real concern. And we've got to make sure as attorneys, I think that we're making men comfortable in say in say any victim really i mean but i know the show is oriented towards men but men have to be comfortable in saying if that's going on and not be afraid to come forward or feel that they're going to be looked at oddly i mean it's a, it's an important issue no matter who the victim is yeah and i think the uh the a point on that men in reporting domestic violence i i had a mentor um bob bradley who he uh the statistic he would always cite was that men will be victims of domestic violence, physical domestic violence, 15 times before they report. And women will be victims of domestic violence between six and seven times before they report. So no right. one's reporting it right away, right. but men are waiting almost twice as long. And, and there's, there's a Harvard study out there that shows that, that says that based on their research, 70% of domestic violence was perpetuated by the woman in the relationship. So yeah. we, we know it's happening, but I see a lot from my clients where there'll be clear domestic violence. There'll be clear issues, whether they have video evidence of it, whether oh, they, yes. there's proof, there's significant proof of it. And the man won't want to pursue that avenue. Um, and, and I'm starting to think it has something to do with almost the biology of men where we're designed to be the protectors. And even though right. that relationship's on the rocks, as a man, they feel like, I still need to protect this woman. She's still a good mom. I can't do this right. to her. Where well, see, the women, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I just, I want to jump in there for just a second because you raise a wonderful point. I think we have to shift the mindset to, it's not about her. It's not about you. It's about protecting that child. Because clearly if one parent is being violent, even if the child is just in the next room or down the hall or whatever else, it affects that child. And it will affect how that child views things in the future to relationships that they themselves form. And if we change the mindset by getting them to think that, look, this just isn't about you. It's about the child you want to raise. And if we if we get that mind shift, I'm, I was hoping that protector, like you said, that instinctual protection is extended to their child. And they're, look, you're not trying to say what a hateful, awful person she is. You're trying to protect your child. Yeah, so true. So we're going to continue this conversation on domestic violence. But the first thing we're going to do, we're going to do a quick commercial break. So we'll see you guys in about a minute. You love your children and want them to have everything. How about both parents? Introducing Equal Shared Parenting Benefits Program. The program is very simple. Sign up, download the app, access services. Equal Shared Parenting Benefits Program offers access to medical market, telemedicine, mental wellness, medical bill negotiation and advocacy, chronic care, and a wellness savings program with membership add-ons available soon, like prepaid legal services, prepaid college savings plans, prepaid identity theft protection services, and much more. Annual memberships starting at just $35 a month. 
Here's what our members say about us. You guys are a huge blessing in my life. This community is amazing. I truly thank you for all that you do. Learn more and sign up at www.tfrm.org. Equal Shared Parenting Benefits Program. It's about the children. They're today and they're tomorrow. All right, welcome back. I am your host, Mark Real Jr., and we are here tonight with Alabama attorney Michael Lambert. So we'll be we'll continue our discussion on domestic violence. And we were just talking prior to the break that, that men typically have that reluctance around reporting. Um, in, in my opinion, California, we have, and I talk about this ad nauseum, we have a pretty bad law on the books involving domestic violence where there's, it's presumed that if you found by preponderance of the evidence to have been convicted or to have perpetuated domestic violence for a period of five years, it's presumed you should not have joint or sole legal or physical custody. So a preponderance wow. of the evidence can keep you from having custody for five years. So in my experience, that law for most men gives them hesitancy around reporting domestic violence where women, a lot of times I see it's, you're going to twist and turn every little thing to try to leverage that. So what is, is, are there any specific domestic violence statutes or anything in the state of Alabama? There are uh, under our protection from abuse statute. The standard is preponderance of the evidence. Um, when the protection from abuse statute first came into being, uh, people were very judicious in how they how they used it. Uh, what just I've personally seen, it is used more and more and more as a battering ram. That when you come, like like I and several of my colleagues will come before a judge, and we show them point blank, we're, we have proof that there's been domestic violence. Um, and I mean, when I say proof, I, I mean you've got some sort of injury, you've got witnesses, video, something that shows that you are the victim. It makes a huge difference. I've even witnessed, um, if you will, in one protection from abuse, uh, a person coming in, a person coming into another's home and one punches the other, one slaps the other, and then the video cuts off. Well, both admit no one else is in the room. So, who cut who first who turned on the video second who cut off the video and obviously spliced it and let's just say that neither one of them were angels in this and uh basically something that some people may be into and others not and leave it as gingerly as we can but it was uh it was amazing to me that this was what was used uh and not even more children were involved just to get a leg up on someone and when it came out, you know, the judge didn't appreciate someone trying to manipulate the facts and, and it all worked out in the end where there's no order and everything else. But in the beginning, you have to try this case with no discovery being done. And in a case where you've got clearly doctored evidence uh, about the only thing you can do in Alabama, at least in my experience, in my experience, is you say, Judge, we'll leave the temporary order in place because we need to do some discovery because this has obviously been altered or whatnot because the judges want to err on the side of caution uh -huh. about not having people together. And thankfully, there were no children in this one. But my gosh, if there had been children involved, you know, what is the judge supposed to do? They've got evidence that's only partial, but it does show someone initiating violence against the other. You know, you just put the judge in a quandary but the, but the evidence has clearly been altered, but not altered in the place where the violence was initiated. So yeah. that, that creates a huge problem when you've got preponderance of the evidence and no chance for discovery. Yeah, that's, that's the biggest issue I have to explain to clients. It's so common that a case, I would say it's, it's probably the third most common opening of a, a custody or, or domestic case out here is via domestic request for a domestic violence restraining order. Oh, sure. And, you get, you're going to have ballpark 15 to 20 days from that initial ex parte temporary order being granted until you're in front of a judge. So ultimately, if it takes a handful of days to serve the other party, you got about 15 days maximum to prepare. The yes. only, the only weapon of discovery based on, on the rules out here in California in that instance would be to do a deposition. 
And I think the biggest issue with depositions, obviously the cost, you're looking at several thousand dollars to conduct a deposition. And then with the rules out here in the state of California, you really have a one, two, three day strike zone, maybe to get them noticed of a deposition. So it would be useful in that DV. So you only have one tool to actually uncover the truth or you're going to walk in and it's going to be he said, she said. Yes, 100 percent true. 100 percent true. And here in Alabama, we don't have the deposition option. Um, it's it's truly frightening, though. I mean, especially where you get people who, are, like you said, are not of means and you've got the court reporter expense uh, and then your fees for doing it, your fees for prepping for it. And with no paper discovery having been done before, you're at a handicap already. So, yeah, it makes it makes it a very difficult set of circumstances. Yeah, you're, you're not even going to I mean, you're not even going to realize the full value because you have minimal information going in. Yes. So that that's the biggest challenge. And I think w when I have these discussions with attorneys, that law and those rules around domestic violence, those are usually the trickiest because domestic violence is a serious issue. But we also realize that in many instances, it's used and it's weaponized against the other party. So see, how can we go ahead? That's where I was going. I was going to say one of the things I wish we could see here. We have a children's advocacy center here um, with trained forensic interviewers. And what I really would love to see is some sort of an adult advocacy center to where parents can be evaluated. Uh, easier mental health, not just for treatment, but mental health evaluation is in some cases really what's needed. Um, and we just don't have it as a resource without going out and hiring the expert on our own, arguing about who the expert is going to be. Is it going to be a battle of the experts between two psychologists or therapists? Um, the whole system is not geared to give the tools to, for the judge to be able to ferret out the truth as far as uh, it goes to, to mental health and, and psychological evaluations, but where well, domestic violence is alleged against there. children. The tools are there, but it's pay to play. It, it is. is. And you can go, and go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I, in, in theory, all of those tools are out there and in theory at this, the, at your use and disposal, but who has, I mean, who on earth outside of uh, the, in the news, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie each spent over a million dollars, but who has $30,000 laying around to, okay, we're going to hire expert a, then we're going to depose them. Then we're going to pay for them to be in court. And then we're going to go through this process and, and we're paying our attorney to, to tag along for this entire process. It just get it's prohibitively expensive. That's one of the major issues with family court. If we talk about access to justice, but that, that's a major issue in family court is having that access to true justice. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, fortunately, I've, I've been able to allow some folks to have payment plans with me to, to try and make it more affordable. And I've had by and far a, a wonderful response to that with folks who just needed help. But it still is a daunting task even to find mental health professionals who are themselves are trying to to try and make the world a better place with the services they're offering, you know. But to want to get involved in the court system, because nothing says they have to. But we have a we have a lack of people who are willing to even be experts in a case just because of whatever bad experience they've had in the past with with either lawyers or judges or whoever. And that that's making the problem, I think, twice as hard. Yeah. I mean, and then. Yeah. So, I mean, that's why you see that the, some of these experts are literally national experts. And yes. you're, you, you can drop easily 10, 15, $20,000 on them and you got to fly them around. And, and there's the, the really everything that's involved in doing that. My, my argument is things like this need to be, and, and you mentioned that with the, how, like they do for children, have a similar center for adults. There needs to be some process at the beginning that actually is able to take a look and provide resources to both mothers and fathers that are going to be going oh, yes. through this process. Because and, you, you made a point earlier that a lot of times that you'll agree on a lot of things with your co-parent, but after that first court hearing and a few allegations get thrown out there, everything hits the fan 
and all of a sudden you can't agree on anything, despite the fact that 19 out of the 20 core issues of the case, you guys would agree on without a second thought. And I wish that I wish that there could be more partial settlements um, on a temporary basis to where, look, judge, these are the things that they agree on. If we can get that in place and only try what's there um, that, that needs to be tried. I know that sounds like I'm prejudging a case, but usually lawyers know, OK, this is where our clients are definitely disagreeing. And let's say custody, for instance. Right. Mm -hmm. Look, we've agreed on money. We've agreed on this. We've agreed on, on property division, retirement accounts, whatever else that they exist. But the sticking point is custody. Um, basically, if that, if that issue could be tried alone or property division could be tried alone or whatever else, that would go a long way. Unfortunately, people see property versus child and whatnot and, and vice versa as a marketing chip. And sometimes, quite frankly, it is in their minds. But that's one of the places where I hope and I always encourage people to go to mediation because medi in mediation, you might actually get the apology that you wanted that they can't, they won't give you an open court because they, they think there's too much at risk. They may give you something in mediation that they would never give you an open court. And it also gives you the biggest chance to have your own say at the end. And, um, pardon? Uh, exact. I, I, you want to, you want to have the judge make a f as few decisions as possible. Irregardless. Oh, absolutely. And the beautiful thing is you might have a mediator there who, let's say one client is, a. Uh, stubborn and they don't want to that that affair that happened they're gonna that's i'm never admitting that that never happened you know there's video evidence okay the mediator can look at that person and say do you want judge so-and-so to come down and say this and do this to you because this can happen to you this is realistic sometimes mediation is a reality check and i think it really helps narrow down what the triable issues are um I've even had to, I've even had to mediate domestic violence cases it, where they're in separate buildings in separate cities <laughs> um, and uh, literally going back and forth between them and doing phone calls. Um, but you'd be amazed even just doing that, how even in those situations, truth comes out, people talk, people do, and, and, and things get solved. It makes a huge difference, I think. Yeah, I'm always amazed by the segment of attorneys that they don't ever want their client to have any direct communication with the co-parent. Um, there are certain situations yes. where that shouldn't happen. Oh, sure. But it, it, it's funny how things, when both sides are represented, how one party says one thing, it goes to their attorney, it goes to the other attorney, then it goes to client. And then the other party is goes right back the other way. And it's a game of telephone yes. and both attorney, both attorneys are obviously trying to put things in a way that's going to be most beneficial to their client. And it doesn't come out in its raw, real nature to the other party. One of the things that I think technology helps us here, there are so many different programs that the courts use these days for people to be able to communicate via text, which the records are kept and can't be erased. That makes a huge difference on informing about school schedules, extracurricular activities. Hey, the mortgage needs paying and here we are. All of those things, I think, help facilitate communication. And as it gets better and better, hopefully, then hopefully those phone calls then can then take place. And then it's they're learning to co-parent because maybe they never learned in the first place how to co-parent. Yeah, the, the education piece, because I think... Uh I can speak for myself. I'm a family law attorney. And until I personally ended up in the courts, I had no idea this world existed. Right. Um, and so no, no one, no one at the altars, like one day we're going to end up in divorce court. No, no one when the day their child's born is like, we're going to fight over custody. Right. So educating people about the process and, and what's ultimately best for the kids or what's going to yes. be best for their finances could go a long, long way. Especially, and the other thing that I always have to refer people out to accountants or to tax attorneys for, you know, you can have tax consequences depending on how things are structured. And I do not do tax law. Um, I know some wonderful tax attorneys and I'm happy to, to give them that business um, and happy to refer out to accountants who, who do a good job as well. 
But that's another thing that, that especially traditionally men have had to bear those burdens of tax consequences without really knowing where they stood, even by the end of the process. Um, so it's important that they get that information from a tax expert from a, uh, who nine times out of 10 is not a domestic relations person, not a divorce attorney, but they need to have that so that they know how to structure it for the future. Yeah, definitely. All right. So we got about 15 minutes left. Uh, anyone who has any questions, I know I got a few up here already, go ahead and drop them in the, the comments. So before we get to viewer questions, I, I got a couple more questions for you here. So sure. in the state of Alabama, in, in general, uh, father walks in and let's just say it's the standard situation of he, he's the one leaving the marital home for whatever reason the divorce is. Um, what, what is, what, what's kind of the standard, what, what, what's the go-to custody in Alabama right now? Um, this is going to sound like I'm really being lawyerly, but practicing in about four to five counties on a regular basis, it depends on where you go. Um, and here's what, here's what it depends on. If you pick up and leave stakes and the kids are left there and you're just gone, that's not going to bode well, in my opinion, uh, for you getting custody especially when the kids got to go to school, kids going to need help with homework, might need to be taken to the doctor. And if your, your wife or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or whoever wasn't communicating before, it's not going to get better when you leave. Um, yeah. One of the biggest things is I would tell people where there's no violence, let me be explicit, where there's no domestic violence taking place is look, if there's another bedroom in the house, even if there's a couch or something, if you're safe and they're safe, you don't invite argument. Don't argue. Be kind. Be golden. What I tell them. Don't don't return fire. If someone's ugly and mean or whatever, say I'm sorry you feel that way or whatever your appropriate response is, and move on. One, you're de-escalating the situation. You're not adding to it. Two, with the child there, you're making sure that you are trying to conduct yourself in a civil manner with the child. Um, be be kind. Um, not that you're not already, but hey, if there's groceries that need to be bought, talk about that. Send a text. Hey, what groceries can I pick up? Is there anything you'd rather me get or not? Be helpful because all of those things, one, no matter how custody goes, you're being a good person. But two, you're actually participating in doing what you should as a parent. And that's the that's just the common sense thing I would see. And I see where in my in my cases where somebody just picks up and leaves and leaves the kid behind and tries to see him on the weekends that does not bode well for you, no matter what your gender is. It just does not. Um, if there's violence and it's gone unreported or anything like that, that's not going to go well for you. <clears throat> and basically the, the, uh, I hate to say common sense, but the more you approach it like a person who's willing to co-parent, the more the courts will treat you that way. In theory, the friendly parent factor. Um, that we're supposed to we're supposed to look at who who's going to be willing to to foster a relationship with the other parent and have a positive relation or with the other with the child and the other parent and if who's going to foster that, yes. a relationship. Yes, if you and and that's one of the beautiful things that I love being written into the law because if it's put into practice, it works. It absolutely works. And you even if you meet a brick wall, it's not about the other person. It's about the person you want to be. And you, the only person you can control is yourself, you know? Um, and I say, thank goodness. Cause I don't want to control anybody else. I have a hard enough time with myself. Um, and I tell people, look, I'm not judging you all fingers pointing back at me. Okay. I mean, I, I know my own, my own garbage as it is. Right. And I say, that's the key. You got to know where your triggers are for things and you've got to avoid those. Um, and some people mentally, they, they have mental health issues or whatever. They're like, Hey, I can't stay. I say, that's not a problem. But you need to go and get seen. You need to go to your doctor, tell them the truth of what's going on. Don't be afraid if they diagnose you with something that, uh, you know, having depression or anxiety is not going to be a death sentence for custody. In the majority of places I've seen in Alabama, because we've had such media coverage about mental health, if you're doing what your doctor says and you're being a responsible person and that's not going to hurt you. Now, if you're doing it, it's controlling you and, and you, you know, some bad decisions are being made on your part and it, your mental health is not being taken care of. Obviously, that's not going to go so well for you. But that's why I always encourage them to do those things. 
Yeah. And so you talked about earlier that there are rumblings of a, a the, the 50-50 presumption, clear and convincing evidence, um, at least finding its way to the state house in Alabama, making its way into the Senate and the House. Uh, have you seen a, a change over the last, we'll say, decade from the way decisions were made about custody and visitation 10 years ago in Alabama to now? Oh, absolutely. I'd say more, you can, I'd say 15 years ago uh -huh. to now is a monumental shift in the way that fathers are viewed than the way fathers are treated. Um, but it depends on those circumstances that we just talked about uh, that are written into the statute. Um, basically you have, you have people, if they do the right thing for the right reason, I know that sounds cliche ish, but it really does work in court and it works in court because once you start living a lifestyle and I don't know in California, but here it can take you on a contested divorce. It can take you between one and two years to get through the system, not because anybody's being lazy, but because that's just how long it takes to get through the process. And during that one to two years, if you've adopted this behavior, you have truly changed who you are as a person or improved who you are as a person. And I think the court sees that over time. Yeah. No, so I mean, it's, we're, we're breaking down walls. We're making improvements. I yes. think uh, my, my big thing, a lot of guys will ask me, why do you think that's happening? And I think it, it's platforms like this on, on Facebook. We have yes. 610,000 uh, members of this father's rights movement page. There are dozens of Facebook groups where guys can go share their stories and learn and educate themselves. And then obviously we have Google at the tips of our fingers now, wherever we're at, where we can just become more educated about what needs to be done. Oh, absolutely. There's a, if, if I may, may I say an organization's name on here? Yeah, go for it. Thank you. Benjamin uh, Gabriel Lee uh, Foundation. Uh, is one of those organizations that's doing that. And I know the, I know the people who are in charge, they, their heart is in the right place. They're not trying to beat down women. They're just trying to give men a voice. And I think that's a very positive thing. Yeah. I mean, there's so many, so many organizations that fit into the landscape. And a lot of times it's, it's the local organizations that are the ones that are able to get things started and make the largest impact. Um, no, the Father's Rights right. Movement may be a worldwide organization, but there, there's limits to what a worldwide organization can do at the grassroots level. Yes, absolutely. You're, the organization is only as good as the people on the ground. Yeah. All right. So we'll, we'll take a couple questions now. So uh, we'll get, we'll do Kenneth's question first, not legal related. Um, <laughs> Michael, are you an Alabama native? Your draw I, is different. Uh, I am uh, born and raised except for my time in, at school in the military. Um, and what's funny is my wife would tell you that when I'm around my relatives, my Southern draw tends to come out or when I get really excited about something, it's not intentional. It just kind of happens. So yeah, I, I know I'm a bit of an odd duck sometimes in the way that I speak. Hey, I, I feel you on that one. I had, uh, someone, I had, uh, Brian Vandiver from Arkansas on a couple weeks ago and, and I, one side of my family's from Arkansas and the joke with all my friends is if I have a few drinks, all of a sudden I get a little bit of a Southern twang in my voice. I can, and I can either confirm or deny that. <laughs> so I, I had a couple people comment that my, my twang came out from uh, talking to him for about an hour. Yes. Yes. I would absolutely agree with that. All right. So me, I had a couple questions here. So, All right, so we'll, we'll we'll take this is more of a comment from YouTube here, but we'll make we'll make it more into a question because I think it it brings up a really good topic. So your ex literally broke the law. I'm assuming we mean we mean the court order, um, and the judge gave her a verbal warning that she'll be arrested next time. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll we'll change the word around. So they probably broke the order. They're going to be held in contempt of court next time they do it. Um, and then the next time it happens, the judge doesn't do anything. So we'll make this a little bit more of a broad question. Sure. If you're in court and your co-parent is not cooperating, not following the court orders, and the judge is just continually giving them slaps on the wrist, what can you do to help your case? Well, one thing that you can do, and this will not win you any brownie points with 
with some judges, but it is the right thing, I think, as an attorney to do. Um, you raise an objection if there's been if there's been violations, particularly on both sides. And I'm going to change your facts just a little bit. Okay. Let's say that one person has violated an order and seemingly minor and gotten slapped down for it with a sanction to find something. Let's say the other party has violated something equally or worse and nothing's happened, just like this, gen this gentleman said. Then now you have an equal protection problem. You now, now you're you've gone off into constitutional law and constitutional rights protection. Um, and if you, you cannot take something to an appellate court that you haven't alleged in trial court. So it's important that that attorney object to that sanction or object to nothing happening as a violation of equal protection under the law, because regardless of gender, regardless of, of anything, people are to be treated equally under the law. You can't have harsh, harsh punishment for one thing and a slap on the wrist for the other where they're virtually the same. So that's the approach that I would take. But judges have broad discretion. Um, if a judge believes someone's remorseful, they made a mistake. Um, and judges are human beings. I'm not excusing the judge in this situation. I don't know who they are or anything else, but they're human beings. Some judges will get things wrong in the, with the best of intentions. And that is a very hard pill to swallow when it's your life, when it's your livelihood, when it's your child. Um, and it's not much comfort, but it is the truth. The biggest thing I would tell the person is keep doing the right thing for the right reasons yourself. Govern yourself and make sure you can prove what you're saying. If someone is lying about what's said over the phone, make do things in text. If uh, if things are, are not progressing that way and they won't communicate, even the silence to reasonable questions is evidence. So you build your case. It takes time. And remember, it's not about one upsmanship. And I'm not saying that the, the, the viewer who said that it, that's what it's about. But it is frustrating when someone violates the law and the judge just gives them the talking to. If a judge would, in my opinion, I'm not trying to tell a judge what to do, but even a hundred dollar fine, a two hundred dollar fine, something to where that slap on the wrist has some teeth makes a huge difference. Because as we said before, remember the large dockets we were talking about before. Will the judge remember this the next time? They're human. Will the judge know this the next time or will it come up in their mind? Did they do they still have that note that they made? You know, all those things weigh into it. So if judges even did just a small sanction, just to, as a reminder, and it were entered into the system, then that would remind the judge the next time they have a hearing. And I, that would be, I think, a wonderful thing to do. It wouldn't break anybody's back, but it would have consequences. Yeah. Building the theme. Like, I think that was a very important point you made. Sometimes you're going to have to get this in front of the judge, have the judge read it, have the judge hear about it multiple times before it sticks. Yes. I mean, out here in the state of California, you're going to see a judge for what could be, you could not say a word and be in front of the judge for five to 15 minutes every three to six months over the course of two to three years for your custody case. You have to build a pattern that reminds them of what's going on and builds on the themes that you and your attorney have built for your case. Constantly. And, and it's, and it's incredibly frustrating to clients when they're like, but we've told them this, but we've told them that. And I literally will well, look at them and, and I'll ask them sometimes to give it perspective. I'll say, what did your kids say to you Monday of last week at about 10 o'clock in the morning? And you get that deer in headlights look. And they're like, I said, that's the same way the judge is on this. He's human. He's not being evil or bad. Or he's not being evil or bad. We just have to remind them. We, it's a friendly reminder. And, you know, I'm sure you've done this a hundred times. Your Honor, I'm sure as you remember, and you fill in that blank of whatever you've already told them, and you reference the documents where you said it, the exhibits where you said it before, and that refreshes his memory or her memory. And I think that's just a healthy thing. Yeah, 100%. All right, we'll take one last question here. So we'll give uh, William some advice here. So we have our first mediation next month. What can a parent do to ensure or to give the best chance of success in mediation? All right. Now I'm giving away my trade craft here for my mediation. But you know what? That my trade craft doesn't matter as much as it, it does help in this person. So, so here's my thing. What are the three most important things that this person wants in a mediation? When you add, when that's asked at a mediation, I have actually witnessed and seen 
two people who their attorneys have done a great job. They've got all the legal issues, but what, uh, what one spouse wants are these three things, you know, A, B, and C. What the other spouse wants is X, Y, and Z. And they pass in the night. You can put it on the, and everything else is easy. I know that sounds silly, but that's the number one thing you can do. Tell the, whether or not it's in the legal realm or not, the other side might be willing to give it. Um, and if you do that, you also show a willingness to think outside the box um, and be willing to give when you go to mediation. You don't have to give away the farm, but really think about what's important to you and really think about what's best if there's children involved, what's there and write it all out for your attorney. Don't don't dump everything on your attorney who's going with you to mediation the day before or the night before. I would give it to them at least two weeks in advance so that they can digest it, talk with you about it. And then they can convey that to the mediator, which will hopefully speed up the process and make everything easier. There's a lot of great mediators out there. Um, and I think they, they, they work really hard at doing a good job in reading what they've been given. And because mediators don't have as big a docket usually as the judges, they can get the nuances. They'll get the details and it can really make things go a lot smoother. That's brilliant. What are the three things that actually truly matter to you? Yes. You can go from there. Yes. My that, 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 that's, that's the gold nugget tonight um, is yes. I think in your case at large, not just mediation, what yeah. actually matters to you or yes. are you fighting over something that's irrelevant? Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we're at an hour now. So, um, Michael, is there anything that you want to uh, leave the viewers with? Uh, you practice in northern Alabama. Where can they find you? Um, my, I have offices in Athens and in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, um, easy to find. You can Google Michael Lambert or Lambert Law Firm, LLC. Um, we actually have after hours appointments and Saturday appointments that we give to people. On Saturdays, people have to put it with a T-shirt and jeans with me. Sorry, that's my Saturday. Um, but the biggest thing is if you pay consultation fee, it doesn't matter if you're here 30 minutes or three hours. The whole goal is to give you enough information to where you can make an intelligent decision. Um, if, if, and it might be a case that, that there's an issue, which I'm not, I'm not qualified to handle. And I'm happy to refer that out. There are a number of good attorneys uh, in North Alabama. Most of us know each other and refer cases out to each other. Um, because we want to make sure the clients are taken care of. But I go anywhere in the state of Alabama. Um, I've got cases uh, down below Birmingham uh, and to state line to state line. So I kind of go everywhere because I don't like being bored. So for better or for worse. All right. Awesome. So that's where you'll find him. If you're in the state of Alabama looking for representation, uh, take a look at him. Make sure if you schedule those Saturday appointments, T-shirt and jeans, it's a Thursday in California, and you can see uh, T-shirts on already. I'm uh, that's jealous. An, that's, yeah, that's an everyday thing in Southern California. So, uh, But uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. A lot of uh, really, really great information. And to everyone that is uh, watching with us, thank you for tuning in. We will be back next Thursday night. 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 Pacific, with another guest uh, on State of the Family Course. Thank you, guys. Thank you.